Uh, hello. Um, we're going to continue today uh, our uh, course on paper recycling and the topic for today is going to be bleaching which is a very integral part of paper recycling. So why don't we get started. Um, just as an introduction, um, bleaching is a chemical process that's applied to cellulose, cellulosic materials um, that we're talking about uh, to destroy chromophores. Now chromophores are um, chemical structures that um, cause color and color is caused by the absorption of light. So these are uh, molecular structures or chemical structures that absorb light and make things look dark. Um, and so what we'll do with bleaching is we'll try to um, destroy these chromophores um, and that will increase the brightness of our pulp and it should also um, reduce the color which is also important. Um, and I just have some examples here, some bars that I just drew up and you can see brown um, here and white here and, and in bleaching of uh, and here we have black to uh, whitish gray. Um, in bleaching, we want to go in the um, right to left direction, of course. And uh, what I want to just remind you is that things have color and are dark because light is absorbed. So here we have chromophores that are absorbing light. And then over here, there's an absence of chromophores. So all the light that's hitting this area is being reflect. It, well, a majority of the light that's hitting this area is being reflected off and we see something as white and bright. So bleaching is um, when, uh, used to, ch to decrease the color and increase the brightness. Okay, so what actually is doing the darkening of pulp? Well, there are a couple things that we're trying to um, destroy when we bleach. Um, the first thing is dye. Um, dyes are used to color paper and they're used in inks. And so these can impart darkness to our paper. And then fluorescent whitening agents, um, they actually um, brighten pulp, but they do it in a specific way. We'll talk about that in a second. But we want to destroy these because they, make, uh, they give us trouble in um, doing color matching when we um, make our final product. Um, we also um, get some color from lignin and uh, extractives in the wood. So. In bleaching, we want to destroy or modify um, lignin um, from wood-containing fibers. And when I say wood-containing fibers, I mean mechanical pulps like newsprint that um, have most of the lignin still in them. Um, interesting thing, bleaching does not affect pigments. Pigments are substances that have color due to the lattice structure of the molecules. So something like carbon black is black um, not because there are chromophores there, but because there, um, there's a lattice structure in that carbon black that um, absorbs the light. So uh, we can't um, bleach charcoal, for example, or we can't bleach um, mineral ores that have color. Um, just as an example here on our slide, um, we, this is a schematic of lignin. It's very difficult to see, but um, that lignin is inside the paper sheet and what happens is when light shines on the sheet then um, some of it's reflected, some of it actually transmits through and then the inside the sheet are chromophores that absorb the light. And these could be the lignin or the dye um, and that's what we're trying to destroy chemically with bleaching. Okay, before we start talking about bleaching I want to um, discuss with you um, some of the things that we'll measure. Um, brightness, color, um, fluorescence. Um, the first thing is brightness. We hear a lot about that in the paper industry and consumers are uh, very interested, at least in the United States, in getting high brightness paper. Um, there are two ways, uh, major ways that um, people um, measure brightness. Um, the first one is um, called GE brightness. That's this Tappy Method T452. And GE brightness um, is measured by illuminating a light at 45 degrees to the sample surface. And then um, we'll measure the reflected light um, at 90 degrees from the sample surface. Okay? And the reflectance is compared to a, um, a control. Um, the other way that's called, um, you know, the other way is called a, um, 
the uh, ISO brightness. You'll typically hear it, per percent ISO brightness. And in this case, um, the sample is illuminated by using a diffuse light source. So um, there's actually a sphere that's reflecting. Um, we shine a light on the, the sphere, and then the sphere um, shines light, reflects light onto the sample. And then the, um, the reflected light is measured at 90 degrees from the sample. And this um, typically, um, historically, um, United States mills have used G brightness. Um, European mills prefer to use ISO brightness. But um, scientifically, uh, ISO brightness is a more re robust um, method of measuring. Um, just, as, uh, just to take a look, the brightness scales, um, what I'm showing here uh, is, um, and I'm going to have to tell you, this is the G, this is the ISO brightness right here scale, and it's going from 82 up to 92. And then um, on this bar right here, we have the um, GE brightness, okay, the directional brightness that the American mills have historically used. And you can see that a 92 ISO brightness is equivalent to about a 94 GE brightness. And a 82 and a half ISO brightness down here is equivalent to an 84 GE brightness. So um, take home point. It's important when somebody specifies brightness um, for you to ask whether this is um, GE or ISO brightness. Okay. Um, color measurement. Uh, we need to measure color because we want to remove color from our paper. We'd, we'd like to have um, perfectly colorless paper and then um, that product actually can be um, as a stable material um, can be dyed in a very controlled manner because we know the starting material. But we don't always get perfect colorless paper, obviously. So there are several color coordinate systems that we use to measure color. Um, for instance, one of, the, um, one of them is called the LAB color space. And um, these three coordinates are used in conjunction to um, tell us what the um, color appearance is for our sample. Um, the L coordinate um, goes from light to dark. The A coordinate goes from red to green. And the B coordinate goes from yellow to blue. And I have a picture on my document camera, and we'll just look at that. Um, if we look here, um, here's a lighter sample, and here's a darker sample. So the L coordinate is um, high here, and then the L coordinate is zero here, I believe, and then L coordinate is negative here. So we've got L going from light to dark. And then um, the other coordinates that I mentioned, um, the positive A direction, this is the A co coordinate right here. And the positive A direction gives us something that's very red. And the negative A direction gives us something green. Um, zero A would mean that it's not red or green. Um, the B coordinate, plus B gives us yellow, and minus B gives us blue. B equals zero gives us neither yellow nor blue. So we're looking for a very high L value. We're looking for A and B values close to zero. So this is just one example of a color coordinate system. Um, what we do is we'll use um, a, um, the, those types of color coordinate systems to determine um, dye removal effectiveness. And one of the ways is what's called a dye removal index. And the dye removal index uses um, slightly different, um, different coordinates, L star, A star, and B star coordinates. And those coordinates are used in a calculation to determine um, how much dye we've removed. It's the effectiveness of removal with the bleaching process before and after um, the bleaching has occurred on samples before and after. Excuse me. Um, fluorescence measurement. Fluorescence. What is fluorescence? Well, we actually um, actually put fluorescent whitening agents in white papers to make them brighter. What are the fluorescent whitening agents doing? Um, they actually take ultraviolet energy, um, UV light, that we cannot see. Um, our, our eyes cannot see that, so we don't detect that. 
But with the fluorescent whining agents put in the paper, that energy is absorbed and then it's re-emitted as visible light that we can see. And what that does is it increases the apparent brightness of the paper. Um, so, uh, like I said, when you go to take the product, if it has fluorescent whining agent, we might have a problem dyeing it or we might just have a problem specifying what the brightness is going to be or the color is going to be because of the fluorescent whining agents. So um, we'd like to measure fluorescence and what we do is we measure the brightness in two ways. Um, first we measure the brightness um, with and um, without a UV filter. Okay, So we're actually going to shine light onto the um, sample with and with, um, with UV light. Okay, this um, with UV light. And so the brightness should be high here if it has a fluorescent whitening agent. Then we're going to do the same experiment, but we're going to measure the brightness with a UV filter that filters out the ultraviolet light. Now this, if there's fluorescent whitening agent, should be lower because um, we've uh, actually filtered out the UV light before it could shine on the paper and give us higher brightness. So um, the fluorescence is, is defined as the brightness without UV filter minus the brightness with the UV filter. So it's the brightness when UV light is sh shone upon the sample minus the brightness when there is no UV light shone upon the sample. Um, now I should mention that um, cellulose and lignin have some um, small amounts of natural fluorescence so we'll never get to zero fluorescence in the sheen of paper. Okay, now let's talk about um, the paper fibers and what gives them color. Um, cellulose and hemicellulose, the carbohydrates, um, are white and colorless and they do not absorb light. So cellulose and hemicellulose, what we usually want for our paper, um, they don't give us color or darkness. However, lignin and extractives, um, they do have some color and their color becomes more pronounced when they're modified. Um, simple modification that we see all the time is alkaline environments when there's a high pH typically sodium hydroxide um, that will increase the color producing groups in um, paper fibers from lignin and extractives. Okay um, this is some examples of lignin um, lignin type groups that uh, um, produce color in, uh, in um, paper fibers. So if you have lignin, you're going to get these kind of structures. What you can see is that they're, some of them have phenyl groups, so they're, um, they're um, cyclical with um, double bonds. And um, it's these conjugated double bonds, the double bonds, se um, two sets of double bonds separated by um, just next to each other basically, the double bond, single bond, double bond. So this type of conjugated um, group here actually causes color and you can see that it can occur um, here with a carbonyl. Carbonyl is a carbon attached to an oxygen with a double bond and then a single bond and then another carbon-carbon double, double bond. So these are um, structures that are in lignin that can cause color. Um, dyes also contribute to the color of fibers and they, um, they can contain aromatic, carb carbonyl, um, or azo groups. And if you look here, um, you can see that these phenyl groups have um, double, double, um, they have conjugated double bonds. And um, here we have a nitrogen double bond, nitrogen, which can also cause um, color. Uh, and then uh, carbon, nitrogen, double bonds over here and so we've got all these types of dyes with these conjugated double bonds that are causing color also. All right now um, I want to talk about the different types of paper that could come into a paper recycling mill. Um, the first one is the chemically pulped and bleached fibers. These are, would be what we use for our copy paper and um, they have zero percent lignin. Uh, and so they're basically white. They're basically hemicellulose and cellulose and any paper making additives, hopefully um, white and bright additives. Then we can talk about um, chemically pulped 
but unbleached fibers. So these are fibers are going to be li like liner board. They're going to be brown. They have 5% lignin in them, but the lignin that's in them has been modified. They're, it's called condensed lignin. And um, what we have are extended conjugated structures, aromatic groups, and several double bonds of carbon. So basically, this condensed lignin that's gone through the craft pulping process and then has been condensed um, is um, much more likely to, is much more pronounced in giving us color and darkness, actually, the natural lignin. And um, in order to get rid of this, um, the color coming from a condensed lignin structure, then we need to use electrophilic agents such as oxygen, chlorine dioxide, chlorine. Um, and this will inter interrupt the conjugation in the color. It will actually break the main portions of the lignin and make them soluble, and we can take them out. Now, consider, let's contrast the chemically pulped unbleached fibers with mechanically pulped fibers, like newsprint. Now, in this case, um, these fibers have 20 to 25 percent lignin which is more than the chemically pulped, unbleached fiber. So you might think it might be darker. However, um, the mechanical pulping process is simply um, has a, um, small, only small to no amounts of chemicals in it, and so the lignin is unmodified. So the lignin is in a natural, non-condensed condition. And for that reason, that lignin um, is much brighter than the lignin that you find in chemically pulped, unbleached fibers. So um, that, that lignin doesn't contribute to the darkness in the paper as much. Um, there are carbonyl groups that are responsible for the yellowing. Um, you know that when you leave a newspaper out, um, it will yellow um, due to reactions. Um, those carbonyl groups are responsible for the yellowing in the paper. And these um, types of paper can be bleached with non-degrading lignin-preserving chemicals. So we can attack these carb carbonyl groups, and, but we don't have to um, degrade the lignin and remove it. We can just use a lignin preserving chemical. And this is important because for mechanically pulped fibers like newsprint, um, with so much lignin, if we were to bleach and then we, if we were to degrade the lignin and take it out, we would lose 25% of our yield. And we don't need to do that. We can leave the lignin in, get a good product at a high yield if we use lignin preserving chemicals. Okay? So um, basically, uh, here, what we're saying is that we can do bleaching in two ways. And one way is lignin-preserving chemicals. So for a lignin-preserving chemical, um, we've got three that are common. Peroxide, which is an oxidizer, dithionite, which is um, a reducing agent, and FAS, which is also a reducing agent. And you can see that um, these, um, well, these chemicals, what they do is they attack these carbonyl structures here, here, here here and, um, these, and here. These carbonyl structures um, give color and they can be destroyed. Um, just this, the, the, this structure can be destroyed, not the entire lignin. So those are called lignin preserving chemicals. We'll use those for mechanical pulps. Okay? On the other hand, if the color is due to um, azo groups or conjugated carbon-carbon double bonds or condensed aromatic structures like in lignin, only lignin degrading chemicals can be used to destroy these, okay? And we, I've listed some of the um, chemicals that can do that, oxygen, ozone, chlorine, chlorine dioxide, sodium hypochlorite. And so they can attack, we've got, I've got the example of some dyes here, and all these materials can um, literally destroy these dyes. Okay, so the first um, type of bleaching that we're going to talk about is peroxide bleaching, and it's the most important of all the bleaching um, operations. Very common in um, mechanical recovered paper pulps. It's also used in, um, chemi in like mixed office waste chemically bleached pulps. Um, peroxide um, makes a liquid solution in water at any concentration. And the active um, bleaching agent is the perhydroxyl anion. Okay, and that acts as a nucleophilic bleaching agent. So this negative is attracted and reacts with a positive nucleus. That's why it's called nucleophilic, so it's looking for a nucleus. Um, attacks that and can, um, um, that's the bleaching agent. So we need to use the perhydroxyl anion 
to do the bleaching here. Um, this is peroxide, H2O2, and in water <coughs> it will form the perhydroxyl anion and um, some acid, H3O positive. Um, however, um, this um, conversion, um, and this means equilibrium, so this can go back, back and forth in the equilibrium setup. Um, we can actually create more of the perhydroxyl anion if we add hydroxide to the peroxide. And that will um, move this, um, this will increase our perhydroxyl anion concentration and improve our bleaching. So we're going to have to use higher pHs and um, a source of this hydroxyl anion to get more of our active bleaching agent. Now peroxide bleaching is the most important bleaching agent used for mechanical um, recovered paper pulps because it um, bleaches in a non-delignifying manner and destroys chromophore. So um, the, the important thing about it is that we don't lose a lot of yield. Um, like I said, um, 20 to 25 percent of uh, the wood in mechanical pulps is, is lignin, and we can't afford to lose that much yield. And here we have the, um, the bleaching agent attacking uh, some of the um, structures, making degradation products. Here we have it attacking um, the carbonyl groups here and um, breaking it up. And see, what I mentioned to you before was that a conjugated double bond, so you have a double bond, single bond, double bond down here. Um, that's the kind of structure that absorbs color, and this attacks that, and then it breaks up that structure, so it's not light absorbing. Okay, so as I said before, sodium hydroxide is the most comical chem common chemical used to increase the perhydroxyl anion concentration, and that's just, I've repeated the equations here. And it turns out that... Um, there's an optimum amount of sodium hydroxide that we should dose into a, um, when we're doing peroxide bleaching. And the reason why is um, if we have too little um, sodium hydroxide, there's not enough peroxide activation. So we don't have the active bleaching agent that we need in there. However, if there's too much sodium hydroxide in there, then the sodium hydroxide or the alkali yellows the pulp. And um, that will decrease the brightness. So really, um, uh, we need to ha um, make sure that we add the right amount of sodium hydroxide. So if we look at this graph, we've got isobrightness, so measure of brightness here, versus sodium hydroxide concentration. And then we have these different curves in there for different peroxide percents on pulp. And what you see is that as you, um, let's just say for the 3% peroxide, um, as you add sodium hydroxide um, more and more, um, you get higher and higher brightness, and then you get to an optimal point, and then as you add more sodium hydroxide, the brightness decreases, okay? And again, it's because we're increasing the activation of the peroxide here. Here, the sodium hydroxide is yellowing the pulp. So it's important to understand that sodium hydroxide in itself will yellow pulp, and that's not um, desirable. Okay, um, typical bleaching conditions. Um, we're going to apply 1 to 3 percent of the peroxide on solids, um, typically less than 2 percent. Um, but the bleaching result improves with increased application. And actually, I can go back um, and we can see it on, the next, on that graph. Here's the peroxide that's charged, and this is 3 percent, and down here is 0.25 percent. So you can see these curves are increasing peroxide charges. The more peroxide we add, the higher the brightness. Um, time, 30 to 90 minutes is, is optimal. Consistency, 10 plus. And I'll talk more about consistency, but we want a higher consistency. The consistency, higher consistencies do two things to help us. The first thing is they increase the concentration of the chemicals in the water phase. So you know that um, if we try to add peroxide to, let's say, 3% consistency pulp, there's a lot of water there. There's 97 pounds of water, 3, per, 3 pounds of fiber, so it's mostly water. The peroxide will be diluted, and the, dilute, and the higher the concentration, the, the, the better the bleaching result. 
So what we want to do is um, uh, use higher um, consistency so that the peroxide does not get diluted. Um, the other thing is that the, um, in the water phase, if we're using water that we've been recirculating in our recycle mill, um, that water picks up organic materials and inorganic materials, and those materials can interfere with the bleaching of the peroxide. So um, the less amount of water that we use, the less amount of these interfering substances, and the better our bleaching um, result. Um, Temperature is 16 to 90 degrees Celsius. pH, I mentioned it's got to be alkaline, so we have to add sodium hydroxide to get a pH like that. We also need real good mixing. Um, this curve just kind of demonstrates the um, impact of consistency of the pulp um, with respect to the final brightness. So as you, um, this is a constant um, peroxide charge in conditions other than consistency. You see here at a 5% consistency, we're getting about 57 brightness. And then up around 30% consistency, we're getting the same charge uh, around 63% brightness. So we see that the consistency um, dramatically improves the brightness in our pulping, in our um, bleaching. And this is a general rule for any type of bleaching agent. Um, in general, higher consistencies mean higher concentrations of our bleaching agent, and that um, means more rapid. Um, bleaching reactions. Okay, now the other thing that we're going to use in peroxide bleaching is um, what's called um, sodium silicate. Um, solutions of sodium silicate are called water glass sometimes. And um, what we do is um, we're going to add this sodium silicate. And the reason why we add it is because um, heavy metal ions in our system can decompose the peroxide and make it um, not a bleaching agent. So if we have our peroxide and there's these heavy metal ions, they can, um, they will decompose the peroxide into two um, HO radicals, which can be further converted to water plus oxygen. And this water plus oxygen um, is not a bleaching agent. And so we can decompose and, and waste a lot of our peroxide if we have a lot of heavy metals in our system. And um, these heavy metals come in with the wood, they come in with the paper, they're everywhere. So we've got to do something about that. And one of the things that we can do is um, use sodium silicate. And that sodium silicate forms a colloidal structure with the metal ions and deactivates them. So um, it kind of um, traps those metal ions and um, makes them so that they won't um, decompose the peroxide. Um, Sodium silicate also has some other um, positive benefits. Um, it's also added to the pulper as a surfactant, penetrant, and anti-corrosion agent. So um, it helps um, liberate ink from the fibers, and it um, helps to um, uh, just kind of disperse those inks in the water phase. So here you go. If you look at um, the effect of water glass on brightness, so water glass is the name for sodium silicate. Um, solutions, uh, you can see that as we increase the um, concentration of water glass at these three um, peroxide charges, um, what, what you see is an increase in brightness, isobrightness, with um, water glass percent. Okay, so um, there's another thing that we can do to um, deal with the metals that are in the system that can decompose the peroxide, and that's um, by adding a um, chelating agent. Um, these chelating agents form complexes with the heavy metal ions and they deactivate the metal ions so that we um, avoid this um, wasteful um, side reaction that occurs when there are metal ions. And uh, Most common um, chelating agents are EDTA and DTPA. And I've got some structures here. Um, what you see here is that you've got a um, main unit, and you've got several arms that come off it. In this case, we've got five arms. And you see that those arms are um, sodium salts. So we have sodium here, and then you have um, basically an acetic acid group here. And what can happen is that these arms kind of collapse and grab 
the um, the metal and um, kind of sequester is a nice way of saying it. And so um, it sequesters the metal ions and makes them uh, not useful for um, um, makes the metal ions not decompose the peroxide. So this is DTPA, and this is um, EDTA. And you can see here that it has four arms, and it's generally considered that the five arms is more effective than the four arms, but both are used. Okay, so um, like I said, this kind of reviews things. Um, uh, one of the reasons that hydrogen peroxide decomposes is uh, metal ions, and we talked about sodium silicate and we talked about the um, the whoop. we talked about the chelating agents like this. Um, another reason why the hydrogen peroxide might decompose is, is from catalases. Um, a catalase is an enzyme produced um, in living cells that um, actually um, is toxic. Um, actually, destroys peroxide. Well, why does it destroy peroxide? Why does the cells make this um, enzyme? Well, the reason why is because peroxide is toxic to cells. And so this is a natural defense that a microorganism or a cell uses to destroy the peroxide that would come in and, and, and um, be toxic to the cell. Um, so these catalases, what happens is they um, actually are formed um, in our water systems in a paper recycling mill naturally. So um, if let run, they'll come to an equilibrium concentration and stay there. Just because the microorganisms have a lot of uh, good food to eat in the water, there's a lot of sugars running around and the temperatures seem to be um, warm so that they can grow. Um, so we get these catalases naturally in our paper recycling mills and um, they can decompose the pro hydrogen peroxide that we need to bleach. Um, two methods of um, trying to deal with this. Um, one, you can thermally denature, so you can heat the um, pulp and the liquid up to a very high temperature and kill the cells. Um, or the other one that's, I think, more common is um, using a biocide. So we add a chemical, um, a biocide, to our water system, and that will um, destroy the uh, catalases. Um, high pH and high temperature. If we get too high pH or too high temperature, Peroxide can also decompose and, and not work effectively. Okay, um, now let's talk about where we can do the bleaching for peroxide. Um, the first place is in the pulper. And this is not really a true bleaching chemical um, in the pulper, but we're actually, what we're doing is um, we add sodium hydroxide or alkali to the pulper to help disperse the pulp and disperse the inks. Um, and, but actually, the um, alkali will darken the pulp. So we add the peroxide in there to just simply compensate for that darkening due to the alkali in the pulper. And it turns out that um, this is a very good way of doing it, um, not just using peroxide in a bleaching stage, but actually splitting it up into the pulper and into um, subsequent bleaching stage later. Um, in this case, the peroxide is used to decolorize the chromophores in the groundwood generated by the alkaline pH, preventing the alkaline, alkali darkening. So peroxide in the um, pulper is used to compensate for the darkening of the alkali. Um, we can also um, put peroxide bleaching, do that in a disperser or neater. Um, it's used to compensate for the graying of the pulp due to the dispersion of the ink. So when we have a kneading or dispersing process like we've talked about before, we're taking visible ink, large pieces of ink and things, breaking them up into subvisible so we can't see them with our eye. What we will notice is that the pulp will become a little bit grayer. And um, we want to compensate for that so we can um, add the peroxide. So there are several advantages to um, bleaching in the disperser. Um, first is that there's newly exposed fiber surfaces because the refining or kneading kind of rubs the surfaces and uh, allows us to get to new fiber surfaces that might have ink or darkness on them. There's good high consistency there, good mixing, and um, high temperature. And so all of these things we can use to our advantage to do the um, peroxide bleaching. Um, some of the disadvantages, uh, there's short residence time in um, a kneading or a uh, disperser, so we might want to have a um, a tower 
to kind of increase our residence time. Um, too high temperature can degrade pulp. So if we have very, very high 100 degree, um, close to 100 degree Celsius dispersion, um, that's not going to be good. And then we need um, to use a chelating agent. Um, we want to avoid using sodium silicate because it can um, build up on the um, refining disks. So um, the other place where we can do um, peroxide bleaching is in a tower. And in a tower gives us uh, ultimate flexibility because we can now control the resonance time on a little bit better um, extended resonance time. Um, typically, we're going to add the um, peroxide to the suction of a medium consistency pump to an upflow tower. And caustic and silicate are added to the conveyor to me the medium consistency standpipe. So. Um, and then we've got post bleaching. So um, actually, after we're done recycling or post recycling, um, we're sending the stock to a high density storage chest or tower. And we can actually do bleaching in there. Um, the pulp is thickened and heated with steam to about 60 Celsius. And then a high shear mixer with um, chemicals are added at an addition point. Um, uh, the high density storage chest tower, um, one to three hours of storage at 15% consistency. So we've got good residence time and relatively um, medium to high consistency. Um, if we're going to sell the pulp as market pulp, we have to neutralize it to a pH of 7 to avoid um, subsequent yellow, yellowing of the pulp degradation. Okay, so um, let me just go back. Uh, peroxide bleaching um, is probably the most important bleaching process, especially for mechanical pulps. Also used in um, chemical pulps, but especially for mechanical pulps. Um, there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, it's pretty well known, the chemistry. Um, we, we know we need to um, control the conditions and use chelating agents and sodium silicate to get the best results. Um, it's an oxidative process, and it um, is not lignin um, degrading, so um, we don't remove the lignin, so we maintain a high yield, so that's a positive. So let's go ahead and talk about another bleaching process, dithionite process bleaching. And um, these letters up here, um, we had, I think, a P for peroxide, and this is going to be, oh no, we had, uh, it wasn't P for peroxide, it was uh, no, I think it was P for peroxide. Um, I'd have to go back and check. I'm sorry. Uh, dithionite bleaching, um, we're going to use uh, the, the letter Y to um, reflect that. Um, this is a common reductive bleaching chemical that can be used for wood-containing pulps. So we can use this on wood-containing pulps, and um, we're not going to destroy the lignin and remove it. Um, it's also called hydrosulfite bleaching, but hydrosulfite isn't the actual species that um, does the bleaching. Um, sodium hydrosulfite right here is um, in water, will um, give us two sodiums, and then we get a uh, dithionate ion, this S2O4 negative 2. And that dithionate ion, the S2O4 negative, um, negative 2 actually, is active. Um, oxygen decomposes the bleaching agents. So um, reductive bleaching chemicals react with oxida oxidative chemicals like oxygen. So we're going to have to be careful when we use this that we, we um, keep oxygen and air um, away from our bleaching process. Um, the other thing is that calcium or magnesium metals um, precipitate the bleaching agent. And so we need to add some keelant actually in this um, type of bleaching also to um, make sure that the uh, dithionate ion is active. Um, where, where can the um, bleaching be done? It can be done in the pulper, first of all. And then it could be added to a disperser at 30% consistency, 80 to 100 degrees Celsius, then diluted and pumped to an upflow tower for retention. The upflow tower is important here because upflow towers are full. They're always full as opposed to a downflow tower. And the upflow, that being full, um, eliminates a lot of the air or the oxygen. 
Um, and it can just be added to a medium consistency pump feeding and upflow tower at 10 to 12 percent consistency also. Applications. Um, here are some general um, application sets or process conditions. Half to 1 percent consistency, 50 to 70 Celsius, 30 to 90 minutes retention, pH now 5.5 to 6.5. So there's something um, slightly on the acidic side. And then a consistency, 3 to 5 percent, or um, in the cases above, even higher than that. All right. Um, going on to our next bleaching uh, agent, FAS, um, formamidine sulfinic acid. Um, tough one to say. FAS, we call it. Um, this is low odor crystalline reducing agent used only for wood containing pulps. And um, it's effective in decolorizing uh, colored paper and caramelized paper that we might have in our um, wood containing pulps. Um, it also, because it's a reducing agent, um, decomposes with oxygen. So we're, just like the dithionate, we're going to have to um, uh, avoid uh, oxygen and air in this type of bleaching process. Now, the, actually, this is stronger than dithionite, and it's slightly soluble in water. It's only slightly soluble in water. It needs to be used soon um, after mixing because it also decomposes naturally in water. Um, FAS bleaching, um, application 0.3 to 1% um, on pulp, 39 minute, 30 to 90 minutes retention, 3.5 to 12% consistency, 40 to 65 Celsius, and a pH of 8 to 11. Um, and in fact, um, we need um, about one part FAS to about 0.5 parts sodium hydroxide for effective bleaching. Um, the initi initial pH should be around 9, and then the final pH around 7 to 8 to, for it to be optimum. Um, any lower than that is not good. Um, high filler content, um, such as calcium carbonate, requires less sodium hydroxide because what that carbonate, calcium carbonate does is it buffers the um, solution pH and um, makes it not decrease um, as readily. And uh, FAS bleaching can be applied in the disperser or in a post-bleaching step. Um, here's an example of post-bleaching. Uh, what we've done here is we've, um, we've got our DIP, our de-inked pulp. It's thickened to 4 to 12 percent consistency. And then our FAS and sodium hydroxide are added here just before a medium consistency high shear mixer or pump. We also add some steam to get our temperature 50 to 80 degrees Celsius. And then we're going in an upflow tower, a reaction tower, and then um, we're doing our bleaching here after our recycling. Again, the upflow tower is so that we fill this entire tower such that um, there's no air or oxygen there, and then we've got our bleach, the inking pulp. So that's post-bleaching. We can also do it um, with um, dispersion. And so here, what we're going to do is we're going to take our de ink pulp, and we're going to thicken from 5 to 10 percent with some of our thickening equipment that we talked about before. Then we'll thicken even more to 25 to 30 percent. Then we can add the FAS sodium hydroxide either here um, in the conveyor to the disperser or kneader, and then we'll add some steam to heat it all up. And then we could also add it after the, um, a little bit after the disperser or kneader. And then that's going to go to another pump with an um, upflow um, standpipe. And we're going to get some uh, bleaching here. And then we've got a reaction tower here. And um, this is downflow. And then we've got our bleach de-inking pulp right here. All right. Um, sodium hypochlorite. Uh, this is going to be um, a lignin degrading. Um, bleaching process where we're going to have to, it's going to, uh, we're going to have to remove the lignin. So this is not useful for um, wood grades. In fact, sodium hypochlorite is being phased out because of environmental concerns. But um, we'll just mention it because it um, has some advantages. Um, we'll just talk about it. Um, it's more of a historic type of bleaching process. Um, some advantages. It's inexpensive, very effective, and can be added to the pulp to remove color. Um, disadvantage, there's no chlorine-free label, and it's prepared by dissolving chlorine gas and caustic solutions. So chlorine gas is, is um, toxic. So we don't um, want to handle that as 
if we don't have to. And then it generates chloroform, which is a carcinogen. And basically, because of this, hypochlorate is being, um, is being um, phased out. And I notice here we've got the, a letter H, so that means that peroxide should be P. Um, we cannot use this for pulps that have greater than 10% mechanical pulp because it'll cause coloring. It will actually color the, um, the lignin in the mechanical pulp. So um, it's going to modify the lignin such that it's going to absorb light. And so we don't want to use this for any pulps with greater than 10% mechanical pulp. So we're going to use it mainly with um, chemically pulped and bleached pulp. Okay, um, here's uh, how we prepare it. The sodium hydroxide in the chlorine gas um, gives us sodium hypochlorite, NaOCl. And then the, um, the NaOCl actually um, is right here. Um, what is, um, so it's this ClO negative right here with the H positive. So this sodium hy hypochlorite um, gives us this I anion and the um, H positive. And what happens is, is that um, we can get um, this hypochlorous acid, HOCl, um, if we are at pH is less than 7.5. So if, um, if our pH is 6 to 7 or um, in that range, then what we get is hypochlorous acid, the HOCl, and um, that attacks and degrades cellulose. So we want to avoid this as much as we possibly can. So we need to have pHs greater than 9.5. I'll show you a graph of that in just a second. Um, if pHs are less than 3, we generate chlorine gas, which is also dangerous when we're not um, ready, and are, um, ready to handle it. Um, yeah, here's a good graph, and um, what we want is the um, hypochlorite, not the hypochlorous acid. So here's the hypochlorite, here's the hypochlorous acid, and you can see that the concentrations of the um, hypochlorite, as, um, hypochlorite is um, high as we get pHs above 9. Okay, so we want to work in this region right here. If we work in pHs around this region, or even in this region right here, we're going to have this hypochlorous acid that's going to degrade our lignin. And then here, down here, is our chlorine gas, right like that. Okay, so sodium hypochlorite, how is it applied? Half a percent to 2.5%, time 30 to 90 minutes, consistency 3 to 12%, temperature 35 to 70, and of course the pH is going to be higher, 9.5 to 11. Um, but let's go back, and I just want to leave you with the fact that this is a technology that's basically um, been phased out. It works very well, but because of the environmental and the health concerns, it's basically being phased out. So um, nice to know about, but um, it's not going to be a very practical thing for um, mills to use today. All right, chlorine dioxide bleaching, D-stage, um, is um, useful. It's another oxidative bleaching. It actually gives us excellent color stripping and large brightness gains. Disadvantage, there's still um, no uh, chlorine-free label involved with that, so we still have the issues, the environmental issues with a chlor chlorine um, atom. Um, process conditions, we'll, we'll apply 0.2 to 1% on our pulp. Um, the time will be 1 to 3 hours, consistency. Um, 10 to 15 percent, temperature 55 to 70, and the pH um, 6.5 to 9.5, with 6 being optimum, which is in the acidic, uh, slightly acidic range, excuse me. Okay, um, oxygen bleaching. Um, this is an oxidative bleaching that improves the brightness and lowers um, chemical costs if um, oxygen is relatively cheap. Removes color and actually um, has been um, purported to detacify stickies. Um, disadvantages, it will not tolerate mechanical pulps. Um, so if there's mechanical pulp, they'll get darkened by the oxygen. And uh, you need a pressurized vessel of 60 to 115 PSIG. Um, the oxygen produces um, radicals that degrade the lignin and also form peroxide, which acts as a bleaching agent with a chromophores. And 
the system that's um, been um, patented by AirProx is called OxyPro. And the applications are down here. Um, you've got certain amount on 0.1%, 60 minutes, 10 to 15% consistency, 85 to 95 Celsius. 1% um, peroxide is actually added as a booster. Um, 0.7 to 1% sodium hydroxide. And then you have silicate and keelant. And um, the pressure is 60 PSI G. Um, ozone bleaching, um, another one. Um, and I, I should just mention oxygen and ozone are... Um, not widely used. Um, ozone bleaching destroys dyes and optical whiteners. Um, ozone itself is a toxic gas, um, but, uh, and it also requires high capital cost in order to, um, to apply it to pulp. Um, it's, this ozone bleaching is not frequently used, but it is nice to know about um, maybe in the future or as an alternative it might be used more commonly. Um, Ozone, like peroxide, is decomposed by metal ions, so the metal ions are going to interfere with um, the uh, bleaching capabilities of the ozone. Um, so what we'll do is we'll use low pH to solubilize some of these metal ions and remove, um, solubilize and remove metal ions, and then we'll use chelating agents to um, remove the metal ions also from interfering. Um, some of the conditions, 0.25 to 3 percent ozone on the pulp, one to five minutes, so it's a very rapid process. 10 to 40 percent consistency, 20 to 60 Celsius pH, 2.5 to 10. Um, so there's the acidic nature of this, which is some, sometimes um, not, des not desirable. The ozone concentration in the gas needs to be about 2 to 12 percent. Um, one of the things I, I, we mentioned this is that ozone is the most effective totally chlorine-free bleaching reagent for removing fluorescence. So um, if fluorescence is a big deal, then um, ozone might be a consideration. Um, okay, just now to kind of wrap things up a little bit. We're getting down towards the end. Um, bleaching sequences. Um, single stages are not effective in reaching 80 percent ISO brightness on MOW furnishes, which is what we um, general um, goal for um, taking mixed office waste and converting it to, cop to grades like copy paper. Um, we usually use two stages for mixed office waste in order to do this. So. Um, and, and one of the reasons why is because the variable incoming recovered paper requires um, two chemicals. Just like we have different unit operations to remove contaminants, um, we're going to have two bleaching operations to handle the different types of dyes or um, bleachable uh, materials that are coming in. So the, the two, two rather than one stage is more robust. Um, the most successful way to do it is combination of oxidative um, bleaching, for instance, peroxide, followed by um, a reductive bleaching, such as FAS, for instance. Um, we need to be careful um, to remove the oxidative bleaching chemical before we do the reductive bleaching chemical, because the oxidative bleaching chemical and the reductive bleaching chemical will react. So if there's residual oxidative bleaching chemical, then that will consume a lot of the reductive bleaching chemical, and that's not good, obviously. Um, it's not common to do the reductive bleaching first because the reductive products, um, and remember the two reductive ones that we talked about, the dithionate and the um, FAS, they don't remove lignin, they just modify it, but they leave it in there. But the modified species are actually susceptible to being oxidized, so we get, we'd reduce it and bleach that chromophore, but then we could oxidize that chromophore back to its original state and regenerate the color. So it's less, much less common to do reductive bleaching first. Um, some common two-stage processes, peroxide followed by peroxide. I mentioned earlier that um, it is more effective to add peroxide to the pulper followed by peroxide bleaching later on in the process. It's just um, more effective than adding all the pro same amount of peroxide all in one stage. Um, peroxide dithionate and then peroxide FAS are very common, um, used both with mechanical pulps and with chemically bleached pulps. And then the FAS peroxide is a little, um, is more, less, is less common. That would be the reductive followed by the oxidative, and we, we talked about one of the 
key um, weaknesses to that kind of process. And um, so, just I want to review at this point. Um, bleaching <coughs> is an integral part of making high quality um, recycled paper. It improves our brightness, it destroys color, and it destroys fluorescence. And all these things are, um, we need all three of those things in order so that we can um, engineer our recycled paper product to have the right brightness and color and that we um, desire. Um, there's several different ways to do bleaching. Um, we can break them down into um, lignin preserving or lignin de degrading. The lignin preserving bleaching is used for mechanical pulps, um, especially because the mechanical pulps have 20 to 25 percent lignin. We want to retain that lignin. We just want to decolorize it, brighten it up a bit, and we want to keep high yield because newsprint is a, we don't want to lose yield on our newsprint. <coughs> On the other hand, um, in order to destroy color, um, we might have to use some uh, bleaching agents um, that uh, destroy lignin, um, like chlorine dioxide or um, oxygen ozone. Um, these these um, methods really do a great job in decolorizing, but they are not. Um, but you can't use them with wood-containing pulps because. Uh, if there's wood containing pulps there, um, these bleaching processes will degrade the lignin, darken it, and that's not good. Um, finally, we can uh, talk about the difference between oxidizing and reductive bleaching. So we have some oxidizing agents and reductive agents. Um, typically, we do oxidizing before reductive. And of all the bleaching processes for recycled paper, um, Peroxide is the most important, and for peroxide, we need to carefully look at the retention time and the consistency, and also we have to deal with the metal ions in the system, and we use chelating agents and sodium silicate to um, deal with those. And um, finally, um, enzymes in our system, uh, we also need to deal with, if they get to a too high left level, they will um, decompose the peroxide also. So um, that will conclude our um, talk on bleaching sequences, and um, that is then.